The United States has been in existence for over 200 years. Think of all the things that have happened in that time. The immense technological and social changes that have taken place. The founding fathers deliberately left the Constitution a bit vague in some areas so that future generations would have the flexibility to adapt it to changing circumstances. And that's exactly what happened. And it's worked for more than 200 years. But now, let's look back in time for a moment. The Roman Empire endured for about 500 years. More than twice the time the United States has existed, the framers of the Constitution closely studied the decline and fall of Rome in order to create an American government that would avoid a similar fate. So far, their efforts certainly seem successful, but it will be another few hundred years before we're really able to say we've lasted longer than Rome did. And despite all the remarkable flexibility our form of government has displayed over the past two centuries, it's almost inconceivable that we'll ever last as long as the ancient Egyptian empire that spanned more than 2,000 years. Think of it, that's 10 times as long as America has existed. Famines, floods, invasions, and plagues came and went. But through it all, there was an unbroken succession of Egyptian pharaohs. Nothing lasts that long, certainly not a government, without a great deal of flexibility. Yet amazingly enough, when it comes to flexibility and being able to adapt to the changing circumstances of history, Egypt isn't even the all-time champion. The oldest and longest lasting empire in the world is that of the Chinese. Many dynasties, many emperors, many reigns, but always the empire endured. How was this possible? It wasn't because of military power or tremendous wealth, because over the course of th of years those things came and went many times. The real reason the Chinese Empire lasted so long was because of the work of two very different philosophers. The first, Confucius, provided ideas that became the solid foundation of the imperial government. He supplied the theories by which the imperial government was conducted. Confucius taught a code of ethics that provided specific instruction on how the ruling classes could fulfill their duty to the nation and maintain law and order. He was essentially a lawgiver, a thinker who supplied some fixed beacons for navigating the ship of state into the unknown future. The second philosopher, whose name was Lao Tse, had a very different perspective. Historians associate Lao Tse's ideas with magic and with mystical powers, but he also placed a very modern kind of emphasis on the need for intuition and the ability to react quickly to change. Lao Tse pointed out that sometimes it is best to advance by retreating, that sometimes wars can be won by losing a few battles, and long-term goals can be achieved by accepting short-term reversals. Sometimes it is best to resist like the tall grasses bending in the wind, or like a river finding a new route around an obstacle. A powerful ocean wave smashing onto a beach may wash away a sand dune, but the individual grain of sand simply goes with the flow and is unharmed. By incorporating both these perspectives, the ancient Chinese emperor developed a structure similar to that of modern buildings in Los Angeles and Tokyo that are built to withstand earthquakes. Their foundations are strongly reinforced, but there's also room for sway and give. Flexibility is simple in theory, but tremendously challenging in practice. It means we have to learn to distinguish between what we can control and what is...
beyond our control. Practicing flexibility requires great self-knowledge and iron self-control like a master of the oriental martial arts. To be flexible does not mean to be weak, to flounder about aimlessly and confused because we think there's nothing to be done. No, it requires self-discipline. Flexibility requires a cool head, an appraising eye, poise, balance, and judgment. Think of the bullfighter in the arena, in front of a roaring, waving crowd, fired by excitement and waiting for the kill. He knows they don't care who is killed, him or the bull. What they want is blood. He knows the bull is powerful, more powerful than he is. But the bull also always charges in a straight line, while he can step aside. And the bull has his eye on the cape and cannot see the sword concealed there. And the bull is enraged, while the fighter is cool and skilled and willing to try all the steps in the dance of death. His only enemy, really, is himself. If he fears the noise of the crowd or the bull's hot breath or thinks that there's only one way to end the afternoon, then the bullfighter, and not the bull, is the doomed one. But if he controls his nerves and knows when to stand firm and when to retreat, then the ear and the tail and the cries of the crowd and the love of the beautiful women will be for him. There's really very little difference between the graceful passes the bullfighter makes with the bull and the fluid motions of a martial arts master who's defending himself against an aggressor. In both cases, the strength and the aggression of the opponent is made to work for the defender. It's like opening a door just as the battering ram is about to break it down so that forward velocity carries the invaders through the gate, past the mark, and on to destruction. Little children often play a similar game when in a match of of war. One side suddenly lets go of the rope and the opposing side falls down. Up to now, we've mostly talked about what might be called tactical flexibility, where a specific situation requires a knowledge of the various alternatives and a specific set of circumstances requires nimbleness and dexterity. More difficult and more important is the inner flexibility and long-range adaptability that are called for from the person who wants not just to survive, but succeed. A very wise man once said, you can't step in the same river twice. Every moment all things are changing, and the next minute is never like the last one. Whenever you achieve a hard-won success, it's always because you've been able to create a flexible response to the conflicting needs and ambitions and feelings of other people. You've been able to sidestep the accidents of fate and the quirks of nature and the innate tendency we all have to depend on yesterday's solutions to solve today's problems. I spoke earlier of how the Founding Fathers relied on the example of Rome as they constructed the framework of American democracy. It's interesting to observe that at one of the times of greatest luxury and power and perhaps complacency ever in the history of the world, the heyday of the Roman Empire, a philosophy arose that attempted to teach these men who ruled the known world how to govern themselves. These philosophers, who called themselves Stoics, taught that in order simply to survive in life, let alone be a leader, you must learn to take responsibility for the way things affect you. At the same time, you must learn to bend with the wind of forces too great for your control. This kind of self-measurement and self-control should be part of every grown-up's character. After all, an adult is the leader of his own family, of his children, who grow up.
up in part learning from his example. To be firm but fair, to be clear and consistent but flexible, is to possess maturity. Kids are delightful, but sometimes they are the most inflexible people on earth. Since circumstances almost never turn out exactly the way they want them to, they are on a constant roller coaster ride in terms of their responses, up one minute, down the next. One young lady, a little girl of five, actually, will only eat her cornflakes in a certain way. If you don't pour exactly one half cup of whole milk straight from the refrigerator into the bottom of the cereal bowl and then add the cornflakes so that they float on top of the milk, and then sprinkle a teaspoon of white sugar over that, she won't eat breakfast at all. Not anything. She could be hungry and cranky and weak, but she will purse her lips together and shake her head so hard that her braids whip her cheeks and she will not eat. In other ways, however, because they haven't formed opinions about a lot of things and lack the experience which can trick people into anticipating an outcome, kids can be far more adaptable than grown-ups. They can accept poverty or harsh living conditions or sudden reverses in fortune. Because for children, all things look equally inevitable and have always been there. Children have softer bones and dispositions than older people, so they're more apt to receive new impressions instead of repelling or opposing them. This is, like all our traits and gifts, both a blessing and a curse.